hands going in. I don't know who that guy was in the video with the long hair, though. I have no idea. So I can I encourage you with one thing as we were going through, through our time of worship there. Uh, something, something just came to me, and it was as, as our sister was sharing there, that I want to encourage you that revival, how many, how many know we need, we need a revival, not just in our, our city, in our church, in our land, but we need a revival across this world, amen? Can I encourage you with something that revival is a personal thing? The revival starts in each and every one of our hearts. So I want you, when you come to the Lord, you ask him to revive you. You ask him to set that spark in your heart because revival is a personal thing, all right? So be encouraged with that this morning. Amen. (laughs) It's good. So we're going to continue on our message um, in search of a church, and I'm going to be talking about a distinct people. A distinct people. So the day that Charlie, my little, my little guy, was born, it was quite an eventful day, as you can imagine. Um, seven, seven months ago, was born, and I, I gotta say, he's pretty cute. He's a good-looking dude, and uh, we're blessed by him in, in our life. But the day that he was born, it was a really hot July day, and Jess was pretty fed up that this baby was still inside of her, and she wanted to give birth, and she just wanted to move on, and, and so she could feel some stuff happening, so she's like, you know what? We're getting this baby out of us today. Well, not of us, because it didn't come out of me. Amen? <laughs> We're getting this baby out today. So she, let's go for a walk. Yeah, let's go for a walk. Went for a walk. Nothing. Let's get a poots in. <laughs> yeah. So we went, and we, we got a poots in. And if you know my wife... The fact that she ate a poutine was a very special day. The Lord is good and his mercies endure forever. <laughs> but then she said, how about this? Let's go to the art gallery. And I'm like, yeah, I love, I love the art gallery. I, it's very good. She said, but we're going to park really far away from the car or from the art gallery. We're going to walk all the way up in this 40 degree weather and we're going to spend the time in the art gallery, and we're going to move. We're not going to stop and look at paintings. We're just going to boot it through the, the art gallery, and we're going to do it fast, and this baby is going to come today. Thus saith the Lord. <laughs> so it wasn't your normal trip to the art gallery. It was, it was that moment where you had to literally keep up with, with Jess. She didn't stop. She didn't... She didn't uh, linger. She didn't take in any of the work, except for a few times she did. Until we started to feel, <laughs> I said we again. Why do I keep saying we? I didn't feel anything. What are you talking about, Steve? <laughs> she started to feel, I'm so glad she's not here right now. And this recording, at least the beginning, will be deleted, I'm, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> oh, hey, Jess. <laughs> How's it going? She's standing up. <laughs> I love you. You're the best. Oh, and Charlie did come. Look at that. So she could, she could feel some things starting to move. And, she, you know, she gives me the elbow. She's like, Steve, I think we should probably go. Like, I think, I think it's now. I'm like, yes, it is. Yes, it is now. Let's, let's do this thing. So we're on our way out. And then I hear the, Pastor Steve, Pastor Steve, Pastor Steve. Somebody said, hey, come here, come here, come here, Pastor Steve. In the art gallery downtown Ottawa, go figure the day that my, li- my wife is in labor, we run into somebody we know. And he's really quickly is so excited to see us. He said, can you wait here for just a couple minutes? I want to go get you something. <laughs> so then he runs. He's, he's fast. He doesn't know what's going on, of course. But he comes, and this man gave us such wonderful things. We were so thankful but it was that moment of, uh-oh, we're stopped. We, what if the baby comes now? We know that we have this long walk that we also need to get back to the car. I told her I would bring the car, but she didn't want to. But looking back on that day, there was very few moments, other than we were, when we were told to stop, that we actually stopped and looked at some, some art. There was some Monet's there. It was beautiful. I loved it. But I think we stopped to maybe look at two or three pieces. And looking back, I was kind of analyzing this this week. 
why or what was it that made me stop, that made us stop out of our rush and out of our worry to actually stop and even just for 10 seconds or three minutes or whatever to take in that piece of art? What, what were the distinctive things about that piece that would make us stop? So I came up with, with three things, all right? These are, gonna, these are gonna blow your mind. I say, are you ready? This is a good one. This first one's really good. Is that beauty, if something was beautiful, it made me stop. If something just it caught your eyes, wow, how did they do that? That is so beautiful. They captured the sunrise so beautifully. Oh, guys, I'm, I'm waxing eloquently this morning. This is so good. It's beautiful. So that's, that's number one. That's, that's an obvious one. Number two was intent. The artist was trying to tell us something that was deeper than just strokes on a canvas, that the artist was, was portraying some sort of deep meaning or something bigger than the painting itself, so intent. And number three was uniqueness, or that it was unique, that there was something different about this, this work of art that made it stand out to us. The use of maybe different material or color or even the way it was painted, the, the technique that was used, or the materials that were used in it. So beauty, intent, and uniqueness. As the people of God, the church, what are some things that will make people stop out of their busy schedules to take notice and reflect on what they've actually seen? Ever thought about that? What is going to make a super busy world stop? Can I parlay these three things? Number one, it's a beautiful thing. The church, the people of God, should be a beautiful thing. They should be heaven on earth. They should be people of love and compassion and mercy. They should also be people of intent that, that go beyond just church people with an, an important story to tell, something greater than just the meeting, that what is your intent? And number three, there should be something that is unique or distinctive about us. Our characteristics that are different should be visible to a conforming world. So today... I got to calm myself down here. I could get preaching. Linda said I should have a coffee in my hand when I preach. I don't want to get too worked up and ruin my reputation, okay? So today is our last series. No, <laughs> today is our last message in the series in search of a church, right? And we're going to look at what makes us a distinctive people. What sets us apart? What does God say that we are as his church? Do you have your Bibles this morning? If you do, you can see the scripture reference right there, 1 Peter 2, 4 to 10. If you don't have your Bible, it's, it's going to be right up on that screen there. There. All right, let's read this. Coming to him as a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious, you also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is also contained in the scripture, behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious, but to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble, being disobedient to the word to which they were also appointed. And here's our main portion from this morning that we're going to dive into. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special I always heard the word peculiar. I always like that one, that translation. The peculiar people. Everybody say, I'm peculiar. I can't even say it. There. Yes, you are. That's when the pastor gets to say amen. 
that you may proclaim the praises of him who are called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but now are a people of God, and who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for your word. Lord, I thank you that it, it lights our path. It tells us the direction that we, we should go. Lord, I pray we would, we would listen this morning, and I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would speak through me. I pray that everyone in this congregation, Lord, that they would be open to your spirit this morning. Lord, I pray that this congregation would recognize who they are in Christ, Lord, that their distinctive nature would, would shine brightly. Jesus, we just love you so much, and that is exactly why we're here. We're here to talk about you. We're here to make you famous. So, Lord, I pray this morning you are honored and glorified. We love you, Jesus, and everybody in the house said amen. So every time that I hear this passage, I can't help but think of my experience growing up in church. And, and think about the songs that we used to sing in church, and as, as a youngster, having no idea what these songs were actually about. My kids do the same things with the songs that we sing right now. You know the song we sing, open up the heavens, I want to see you. That song, right? My daughter thinks that it is, open up the hammers, I want to rock. <laughs> I have no idea where she got that from, but she's just a rock star in the waiting. Look out for Anna Graysaw. She's going to tear up this world. So me, when I was visiting a church in, in Bangor, Maine, oh, Bangor, Maine, the, central of, the center of the universe, if you've been to Bangor, Maine, you know exactly what I'm talking about. The song went like this, if you think I'm strange, I thought the next word was, I'll rearrange your face. But it was, don't wait for me to change. You know, the music's going, you don't always understand, if you think I'm strange, I'll rearrange your face. <laughs> Pastor jo Jeff talked about giving a jab last week, right? That's, that's what this song is all about. I always used to get, we used to sing the song that, that this scripture was from. For you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation of peculiar people. I was like, what is that song all about? Like we're singing that we're supposed to be weird, that we're supposed to be different, we're supposed to be strange. I, I, I would get caught up in that. And I just didn't get it. Anybody else have, ever have an experience like that with songs at church? Yeah, maybe one or two? Yeah, you're all lying. <laughs> I want you to look at your neighbor right now and just say, I'm not weird, I'm peculiar. <laughs> Here's the truth this morning. Guys, I'm, I'm very cultured this morning. I'm going to pull up my Perrier. I don't know if this is acceptable or not, but it's good with peach. Ooh, fancy. It's cultured. I go to the art gallery, I drink Perrier. Man, my goodness. I want to encourage you this morning in the fact that you are a chosen people. I'll just give you some scriptures. Ephesians 1, 4 says, For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. John 15, 16 says, Jesus tells you, tells them, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit. So if we're looking at the, the Jewish system, here's, here's exactly how the religious leaders of the time were chosen. See, a student who would do really well in school would advance, and then he would be able to choose a rabbi. Someone that he really looked up to, and he would be able to be mentored by this rabbi. He would emulate, he would probably pick up his mannerism, mannerisms, and he would um, just follow him around and be mentored. So this was like the top of the class, right? This was, this was the, like the 90 plus students, the ones that I have no idea, I don't even know their names. But this was the top of the class. And then there were those who missed the mark. And they would end up being not religious leaders, but they would end up being fishermen, builders, tax collectors, or they would 
they would take up a trade. I don't know about you, but does that group of people sound somewhat familiar? Fishermen, builders, tax collectors, tradespeople. See, this is the DNA of what a disciple is. This is the DNA of people who would change the world as we know it. This is this group who was rejected by religion, but chosen by Jesus. Oh, that's good. Jesus saw them and he saw their value when no one else would. And the gospel was taken to the entire world by this bunch of rejects. This bunch of group who were second string, who weren't your 90 plus student, who probably weren't even able to go to university, who couldn't succeed in, what the, in the eyes of the world. Reminds me kind of of being at elementary school. Y'all know where I'm going with this. There's two captains, normally the best athletes, the best looking, the smartest kids, and always never me. Pastor Nick, that's enough. And they were chosen by who? The teacher. The teacher was in in this little scheme, in this little game. He would choose the two. And they began picking the best athletes. They began to pick their closest friends. And, and obviously the most popular kids, because that's just who gets chosen. I don't know about you, but this is cruelty in its finest form. Actually, no, there's, there's one other one that's even worse, the spelling bee. The spelling bee is worse. Stand up, you get it wrong, sit down, you're not smart enough. Oh, just in front, just what kids need. So the more and more kids go to their sides, you stand there in line feeling like a loser, just hoping, this is somebody else, of course, I'm not speaking about myself, of course, feeling like a loser, just hoping and praying that someone would please choose you, hoping that you are not the last one chosen. And one of the captains finally shows how generous he is, and he says this line, you can have him. <laughs> you can have him. Are you kidding me? I'm the last one picked. That's cruelty in its finest. This is the second choice. These are the people that nobody wants. Have you ever won wondered why God chooses us? There's nothing special about us. I hate to break it to you. There is nothing special about Pastor Steve. I am not that special. I study hard. I read my notes, and I'm reading to you this morning my thoughts. I'm not that great. There's nothing special about me. Amen, Pastor Steve. Preach. Here's the beautiful thing. Why did God choose us? He chose you because of his undying love for you. That's why he chose you. Nothing more, nothing less. He chose you because he loves you. Deuteronomy 7 says, The Lord did not set his aff affection on you and choose you because you were more numerous or greater than other people. For you are actually the fewest of all people. But it was because the Lord loved you. Come on, you are loved and you are chosen. When we walk and when we talk of chosen people, the, the Greek translation, the little translation, actually means that we are a chosen race. And this idea is that we are, that after we come to Christ, we become brand new. Not only brand new individuals, but a brand, brand new race. We are no longer red, yellow, black, white. We are a new chosen people. We are a new chosen race. Those, those distinct things that, that might set us apart in this world don't matter. But when we become Jesus' people, the color of our skin or financial position, or whether you are a man or whether you are a woman, whether you are old, whether you are young, listen, it doesn't matter. See, this is something that is beautiful. This is one of those things that the world will stop and notice, hey, listen, that church, there's, 
There seems to be such unity there. It doesn't matter if you're black or white or young or old or rich or poor or diseased or well. It doesn't matter. This is one of the things that the world will stop and notice. See, there, there are no second string chosen people. There are no you can have them type people. I want to encourage you, if you are a follower of Jesus, pick up your head. Be encouraged. Make change. Let's do it together. So there are a couple misconceptions I, I think about being chosen. I'm just going to fly through these ones really quick. But I, I, I think we need to, to talk about them. Some miscon- misconcep- misconceptions. It's that Perrier, I tell you. Being, about being chosen of God is number one, we are not a better people. I said we are not a better people. The fact is we just align ourselves with Jesus and therefore we're blessed. When I said we are not a better people, but we align ourselves with Jesus and therefore we're blessed. See, the, the scriptures tell us that we are to not boast in ourselves, but we're to boast in Jesus, that we are to make Jesus famous. So number one, we are not a better people. Number two, being chosen isn't always easy. Let's be honest, the guy, Jesus, who we follow, what happened to him? He was crucified on a cross. What happened to his disciples? Majority had awful deaths. Being chosen isn't easy. Number three, there are expectations on you when you are chosen. If I'm the first overall pick in the NHL draft, this is just fictional, I promise. And I go and I play for the Colorado Avalanche as the first pick of the the NHL draft, right, Pastor Nick? Do you want me on your team, Nick? Is that what that was? And I go, and I can't skate. And I I can't, I, I can't, I literally can't skate, but, and I can't skate. I don't even know how to lace up my, my skates. Don't know how to put my pads on. I get on the ice and I, I fall. I think they might be disappointed in me. Being chosen, maybe, as long as I get my contract. But there are expectations on you when you're chosen. It's true. Which leads us to our next point, that number one, we are a chosen people. But number two, we are a, a holy nation. See, this is the terminology that was used of Israel. Exodus 19, 6 says that they were called a holy nation, that they were set apart by God for good works to serve him and worship him. In the same way, we have been chosen and set apart for good works. This is the sort of stuff that separates us. This is the sort of stuff that makes us distinct. Paul says about believers in Ephesians 2.10, he says, for we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. The word here that was used for workmanship in, in Greek is poema. I think I'm saying that right. Sounds good anyway. Just go with it. From which we get the English word poema would be what? What do you think? Poem, you guys are smart. We are God's poem, his artistry. Look, I'm talking about art galleries, drinking Perrier, now poems. Classy. Poems are carefully crafted and constructed with each verb, adjective, adverb, noun, and preposition to to achieve the desired goal, a desired goal, which is a, a work, a poem that will impact people. See, God has carefully, just, just as the, the artist constructs poetry, God has carefully crafted and constructed you through, through your life events, through teachings, trials, and for the purpose of, of giving glory to God, for producing works, for showing in tangible ways that God is good. See, God chose us to display his artwork, his character and his good works to the rest of the world. 
So that, that's one side of holiness, right? That's the, that's the product of holiness. But there's also a requirement with holiness. The requirement of, of staying unspotted or free from sin, free from the pollution of sin. James 1.27 says, Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless as this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. The church, you, me, we're a holy nation. Set apart from sin for the purpose of doing good. For the purpose of sharing God's love in tangible ways. So how do you and how are you staying unspotted? Unpolluted from, from this world that we live in? How, how do you stay clean? How are you practicing your faith that helps and serves others? I think that a lot of Christians have religion, have the process down. But they're not practicing holiness in their lives. And essentially, this type of religion will make absolutely no difference for them or for other people. Here's the beautiful thing. Is we cannot make ourselves holy. We cannot make ourselves holy. It is God's living presence. It is His Spirit inside of us that makes us holy. See, God's holiness in your life, it makes a difference. If you're that, living that bland Christian life simply warms a pew, ask yourself, how is God's holiness present in my life? You know what's crazy? My driest time as a Christian was when I was in Bible school. I don't, I don't know what it was. My, my driest time was when I was studying theology, studying the one who I love. But I think it was because my relationship with God suffered because I was looking at it only as knowledge. I forgot that the living Savior was inside of me. I was talking to uh, someone this week about a poem their son had written. It was a beautiful, shared it with me, it was a beautiful poem. This, this poem was full of was tension and beauty and just different perspectives. It was carefully crafted. There was a lot of, a lot of hard work that went into this. See, this poem took over, it was probably about a 200-word poem. It took this, this individual over a month to write it. But it was in that process that it just got worked out. It's through that time of just crafting those careful words. Here's the truth. Here is truth. It's that we are still being worked on. We don't have it completely cased yet. We don't have it figured out just yet. We stumble and we fall and, and we have moments where we miss the mark. I think it's because we do it by ourselves. And we don't allow the Lord to keep working, working on us. I want to encourage you this morning, keep going. Let God keep working in your heart. Let, let the Holy Spirit continue to, to work through you. My community group um, is been going through the book, The Artisan Soul by Erwin Ir McManus. And I'm going to put a plug in here. If you are not in a community group, you need to be. Our church is in need of community group leaders. We need, we need people who would take the responsibility. And we're going to be talking in just a minute about a royal priesthood, but we are all to be serving each other. We are all to be priests and priestesses. You can lead a community group. Anyway, that's, that's one for free. I could get talking on that. But my, we've been going through this book, and it's, it's been kind of an interesting read. But in it, he wrote this about Van Gogh. And Van Gogh, man, I am so cultured today. This is great. 
Van Gogh wrote this. He said, if you hear a voice within you say you cannot paint, by all means paint and that voice will be silenced. Come on, there is an enemy of holiness. There is, there is one who wants to create doubt with inside of us. And he wants holiness to simply be rules, regulation, religion with zero action. If you want that voice of doubt to be shut up, sometimes we need to simply meet the needs of the poor, walk with those who are anxious, and simply do the holy acts. As Van Gogh would say, paint. Do what God has called you to do. Just do it. Sometimes there's no other words than be involved, be active. Let your faith come outside of you. God has chosen you as a holy nation to represent him and to serve others. So you are chosen people. You are a holy nation. And you are a royal priesthood. I like that music. That's good. I've got to get my salsa on. Salsa. And we are a royal priesthood. I am so distracted. I don't know if you guys know how distracted I can be sometimes. So I talked about Anna, our, our little rock star to be. Uh, but my son Thomas, he's, he's the cutest little guy. He looks just like me when he was a little boy, so he's cuter than you would ever imagine. Thomas is, <laughs> Thomas is our social butterfly. I don't know if you know this about Thomas. He will talk to absolutely anybody. It's a little scary sometimes as a parent. He'll go up to, the, to anybody in the park. Hey, my name is T-H-O-M-A-S, Thomas, but you don't say the H. My name is Thomas. Nice to meet you. I'm Thomas. What's your name? And the other kids kind of run away. And who is this strange kid? <laughs> but he's our social butterfly. He, he loves people. He hates being alone. Like, he absolutely hates being alone. When he comes... Uh, he'll sit, not like if we're on the couch, he will like take up all your personal space. He will sit so close to you and he wants to cuddle. He wants to feel your touch. He just, he's that boy. He's that kid. And he, in most situations, most people would say that he is the most confident boy that you would ever meet. Except when it comes to making decisions with this boy and telling you what he wants you try to get a decision out of Thomas, it just, it doesn't work. He knows exactly what he wants, and this is what drives me crazy. He knows what he wants. He just won't tell you. He won't. He refuses to tell you. He'll say, when he was younger, he would say, you say. I say, what? You say. No, like, you tell me what I want. I'm not telling you what you want. Now it's progressed to... Give me options. Are you kidding me? <laughs> or he will say, what are my choices? Here's the deal with Thomas. He knows what he wants, but is afraid to ask for it because he does not want to be rejected. He does not want to hear the wrong answer. He wants you to say it, and he'll say, yeah, that's the one. I want toast and peanut butter. Yeah, that's the one. He has a voice and Jess and I were like, Thomas, you have a voice. You have an opinion. Share it. Let us know. I'll probably tell him to not do that someday. Don't give us your opinion. Don't use your voice. Not right now. But he has a voice, and he has an opinion. Here's the thing. As royal priests and priestesses, we have a voice. You have a voice. See, to understand this, let's go back to the Old Testament and review really quickly what a priest was. See, with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the, the patriarchs, God would speak directly to them. But with Moses and the Jews, there came a time out of Egypt where God set apart the tribe of Levi to have special relationship with the nation of Israel. They were the tribe of priests, the tribe of Levi. It was their job to come to God on behalf of the people and come to the people on behalf of God. You had no direct communication with the Lord. He, would, he wouldn't hear you. You had to go to the priest, and he would, he would share for you. But Hebrews tells us that the priests would, would first offer sacrifices for their own sin, and then they would continue to conduct business on behalf of everybody else. 
offering uh, sacrifices for sin for the people. Revelations 1 says this, To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom of priests to serve his God and Father, to him be glory and power forever and ever. We now have direct communication with the Lord. We have now been given that title, every single one of us who follow Jesus, of being priests and priestesses. That's a hard word to say, priestesses. I feel like I, the S's need to go on, priestesses. So what does this mean for, for us in Orleans this morning? It means that we have direct access to God. It means that your voice is heard. It means that when you lay hands on the sick, they'll recover. It means that when you pray for somebody, they will be set free. It means also that sometimes you must be a voice for the voiceless. It means that this place, this body is an army with the ability and power to hear from God and to change the atmosphere, to change our city, our nation, and our world that, that desperately needs change. I, uh, I, was, I wasn't going to share this. Maybe I will. It's never good when someone says that. <laughs> when, I, when I was preparing this, I was thinking of our, our country our country of Canada. And listen, our, our prime minister, we're to pray for him. We're to lift him up. We're to honor him. We're to bless him. We're to, we're to pray for him. And I, I pray, I, I pray myself that God would change his heart, that God would, would work on his life and, and he would continue to, I don't know, send people his way, send people his way to speak to him. But then I started thinking, our government reflects the heart of our nation. Our government reflects the heart of a nation. If we want change, if we want change, if we want to see the nation of Canada reach for Jesus, we need Jesus to impact hearts and hearts and hearts and hearts and hearts. We need Jesus to impact your neighbors. We need Jesus to impact those um, who are living around you. We need Jesus to impact your workplace. We need a change of heart. We want to see this nation saved. We want to see this nation come to Jesus. It's by the one. It's by your neighbor. Anyway, that's, I told you I shouldn't get into that one. <laughs> Things not to talk about in church. Politics, point number one. Timothy 1-5 says, for there is one God, and he is our mediator between God and men, the man of Jesus Christ. I'm so thankful that we don't need a system of priests and confessionals, but we can come directly before God and present our request to him. Hebrews 4.15 says, let us approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Be confident this morning, because do you know who you are? For the Jews, they, they might think back to the royal line and descendants of the King David. Jesus was born into the royal line, and for Jews who did not have this heritage, they fe felt less important than somebody from the royal family. But think about royalty for a moment. What does the queen, what does Queen Elizabeth have to do in the morning to be the Queen of England? Does she need to put on her makeup, her crown? Does she need to, I don't know, have breakfast first? What, what does, maybe eat a scone? I don't know. Here's the thing. She doesn't have to do anything to be the king of, queen of England. She just is. She just is the queen of England. She's part of that heritage. She's part of that family. See, for us, it's not about what we do, it's about who you are. 
See, we have this special relationship with God. It's nothing that we have done, but it's because God has created us to be this way. It's who we are. We are part of his heritage. We are the royal priesthood. Come on, we sang it earlier, who the sun sets free is free indeed. I'm a child of God. That he is for you. He is not against you. It's who we are. It's time for church. It's time for you to walk in confidence as a king, as, as a son and daughter of the king. Act in confidence. I'm going to give you permission this morning, even with Pastor Jeff away. Don't tell him I did this. Just kidding. Even with Pastor Jeff away, he's probably watching me right now. Hey, Pastor Jeff, how's it going? He, was, yeah, he never leaves us. But I'm going to give you permission this morning to be active priests and priestesses and make change. If you see somebody sick, come on, I, I release you to go pray for them. I release you to speak into somebody's life. Be who we are called to be. Be that child of God. Walk in confidence. Lastly, and this is, this is quick here, is that we are to be a people of praise. See, verse 9 says, we, his own special people, that we might proclaim praise to him who called you out of darkness and to his marvelous light. Psalm 103 says, know that the Lord is good. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people. It's beautiful. The Lord created us. He redeemed us, and we belong to him. See, he redeemed us. He brought us from, from darkness and into light. And he did this on purpose. So we are chosen for a distinct purpose. What are you chosen for? You are chosen as elements of praise to the Lord. You are chosen to praise God. That is the sole purpose and why you are, are chosen. Sometimes you have to stop and think, right? Where would I be without Jesus? Where would I be without, without God if I was still left in darkness? I think if, if I look back at my life, I don't know where I would be. In some of the, my, my, my own nature, who knows where I could be? But I am so thankful that God has called me from darkness into light, that he he did redeem me. The Westminster Catechism was a training tool, and it was used for leadership in, for generations, and the question was asked, what is the chief end of man? The answer is simple. Is the chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Somehow we seem to forget the purpose of glorifying God or praising Him. I think we act sometimes like God exists to glorify us. We first pray for God to help us, bless us, meet our needs, heal us, come through. And the cool thing is, is He will. He will come through. There's nothing wrong with these prayers. But that's not where we should start. That's not where we should start. Can I encourage you this morning? Can I share this with you? That we're to bring our praise first. I said we're to bring our praise first. We're to lift Jesus up first. We are to make Jesus famous, not our circumstances, not what is going on with our lives, but we are to make Jesus famous, not that other stuff. When we used to say we bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. So in spite of your circumstances, Jesus first. Praise Jesus first. I know this morning that there are, in this, this group, that there are certain people here who know these truths in their heart, these things that we've been talking about. But due to circumstances, praise right now is just difficult. Praise is hard right now because you don't feel like it. It's, it's hard to get your eyes off of your bank account. It's hard to get your eyes off sickness. It's hard to get your eyes off marriage issues. 
I'm telling you, if we bring Jesus first, if we praise Jesus first, he will step into all of those situations. He might not change everything the way we want it to be, but if we bring Jesus first, if we praise him first, we sang a song this morning, and I love this song, and I promise you, I don't, I don't want to be one of those worship leaders who, who kill songs because that's what we do with the good songs. We sing them too much, and then you get tired of them, and I don't know. It's like trading my sorrows all over again. But, but we sang this song this morning. It was raise a hallelujah, right? We raise a hallelujah, which means God be praised. We raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. Regardless of what is going on around you. So this song was was written by Bethel Music. It's a beautiful song. And this this song was written out of a, a moment where one of the pastor's kids who was two years old, just this Christmas, they, they couldn't figure out what was wrong with him. He was fighting for his life. This little two-year-old boy named Jackson. And he was fighting for his life. And so as a staff, as a church, they started to come together in, in moments of prayer. And they got word one night that, that the little boy probably wasn't going to make it through the night. So the author of this song said, I felt defeated. I felt broken. And then this melody started to come out of me. I raise a hallelujah. God be praised right now. Even though the enemy is encamped around us, even though I have doubts, I raise my hallelujah. We need a church, a distinct church that raises hallelujahs that says praise be to God in spite of everything that's going on, in spite of sickness, in spite of anything. We need to raise a hallelujah. Amen. So this morning, here's what we're going to do. We're going to, I should get Anna up here because she's a rock star. What we're going to do is we're going to stand up, and this is going to be our, our close this morning. Yeah, there we go. We got a drummer running. He missed his cue. There he goes. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. We're going to raise a hallelujah this morning. We're going to praise our God. We're going to be excited because he has done good things, that he has been faithful in the past, and he's going to be faithful again. Amen? Amen. Let's sing this out. Hallelujah. Come on, let's lift our hands in this place this morning. Hallelujah. 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 Come on, let's raise a hallelujah. I raise a hallelujah. In the presence of my enemies, I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. Yes, we do. I raise a hallelujah 
let the symphony of praise rise up in this place right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. God, be praised this morning. Be praised this morning. Lord, our one distinct thing is that we are to be people of praise. You have chosen us. You have made us royal. You have made us holy that we might declare your praise. So God, this morning I pray for our church. I pray for each and every one of these individuals in this place that we would go out as people of praise. Lord, we would go out lifting you high. We would go out and make you famous, oh God. Lord, that we would raise our hallelujah, that God is to be praised. Lord Jesus, be praised this morning. Be with us as we go. Holy Spirit, minister through us. Open up opportunities this week as we go that we might be people of praise. Jesus, we love you so much. Thank you for all that you've done. And we pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody in the house said, amen. God bless you as you go this morning. Hallelujah.